Warning, this episode contains words that Spellcheck often corrects to duck. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com, All Birds, and by God Awful Movies Live in Toronto, May 7th. God Awful Movies Live in Toronto, May 7th, because we missed you just as much as you missed us. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, this is Tim Russ. According to logic, we did evolve from filthy monkey men. It's March 17th. And it's Purim! Drunken Jewish Halloween? Yes, please. <laughs> I'm no illusions. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Martha Stewart's, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Idaho Republicans search desperately for the gay porn in their local library. <laughs> the Streisand Effect leads a whole bunch of Idaho students to find plenty of delightful gay porn. And bullshit will finally take offense at the comparison. But first, the diatribe. It's hard to find the silver lining around the dark black cloud rising out of the dumpster fire of current events, but it has been nice to see the larger culture slowly wake up to the stupidity of assuming the middle ground has some merit simply from being in the middle. It's a problem we've been talking about for quite a while in the atheist and skeptical movements. It's the reason many of us, myself included, stalled out in agnostic territory on the way here, and it's the reason the mainstream media platformed medical misinformation and conspiracy theorists for so long. So from our vantage point, the problem has been obvious for decades. But the broader culture needed a pandemic to see the problem with anti-vaxxers, and they needed a liar as blatant as Donald Trump to see why the truth isn't always halfway between the major parties. But as obvious as this fallacy seems... And as beneficial as ousting it clearly is, we still haven't taken the next logical step of removing it from our arguments. I'm not saying that we argue that the middle ground is meritorious, of course, but we're still stuck, as a culture at least, on starting our debates from the assumption that it is. Let me give you a perfect example that I saw online the other day. It started out when a friend posted something on Facebook along the lines of religion is child abuse. Um, now, this isn't normally something I generally endorse in public. I'm not saying it isn't true. One can mount a pretty convincing argument that it is at the very least psychological abuse, but that's the kind of thing I'm generally only going to say when it's just between us atheists here, right? It's, it's the kind of statement that's really easy for theists to argue with at least well enough to get the movable middle on their side. It's the kind of thing that sounds hyperbolic to the average person. And considering how many easily defensible issues we can take with religion, why leave with something that's going to put us on the defensive right away? All that being said, the dude's statement wasn't wrong. It was a bit more nuanced than I'm giving him credit for. He, he wasn't just posting like religion is child abuse so apropos of nothing. But the crux of it was that it was psychologically abusive to teach children that they could go to hell. And that's true. But that didn't stop one of his relatives from chiming in to defend religion against those accusations. Now, this person who identified as a non-believer in their response pointed out that, sure, from an atheist perspective, that might be true. But if you actually believe that hell is real, it would be abusive not to tell your children that they could go there. And as weak as that argument was, it was apparently enough. The dude backed away from his original claim, conceded the point, apologized and moved on. Now, you know, maybe it's because he's less inclined to argue with his family than I am. Maybe this family member happened to be the rich one with the terminal illness. Maybe they're just a pain in the ass to argue with. But to be clear, this is not a good fucking point. It's a dumb one. The, the, the person who ties their autistic kid to the bed and tries to beat the demon out of him with an exorcism ritual no doubt believes in what they're doing. And from their perspective, it would be child abuse to just leave the demons in them. That doesn't stop the shit from being child abuse. This is reality, not a court of law. Facts matter. Sincerely held religious beliefs don't move the fucking needle when we're talking about morality. And yet this argument sounds reasonable to most people. This is not the first time that I've seen an atheist back down in the face of it. Hell, I've seen atheists presented as a, like a preemptive refutation for those that might be inclined to point out how abusive the hell myth is. But the only reason it manages to sound reasonable at all is because we haven't fully excised that idea that the middle ground is some kind of sacred starting point in debate. Yeah, look, 
where there is generally equivalent evidence, one might have to start from a neutral point to determine an answer. That principle holds even when that evidence is equal because there is none on either side. But you can't apply that principle when the lack of evidence is the only possible evidence for one side. Right? If I'm arguing something doesn't exist, the lack of evidence it doesn't exist is my whole fucking argument. The, the, the fact that all the evidence is on my side shouldn't be a fucking handicap. But when we insist on a but what if they're right position, that's exactly what we're turning it into. And sure, you can play some dumb linguistic hocus pocus ass game where you define God in just such an insubstantial way that it could exist evidence free. But that shouldn't matter. I can do the same shit with Optimus Prime. But even if it does matter, right? Even if we accept that, we're not talking about the existence of God here. We're talking about the existence of hell. That's nine steps on from God existing, right? You have to prove that God exists, which God exists, that he inspired the Bible, that we're interpreting the Bible right, that God never changed his mind on the hell criteria. Just all kinds of unproven assumptions built on top of the fucking king of unproven assumptions, this is why we can't argue about religion on neutral grounds. Standing halfway between reality is real and reality isn't real is conceding too much from the beginning. Our starting point has to be the mutually observable aspects of the universe, and none of those include God. We have to be able to start from the point where religions are wrong because religions are wrong. To do otherwise lends itself to this, but what if they're right reasoning that would excuse psychologically scarring children for fun and profit. And if it's proven nothing else over the thousands of years of written history that we have, faith can never be given the benefit of the doubt. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Mario and Luigi to my toad, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to jump right in? I like it. I am very well rounded. Sure. Much like mm-hmm. Mario. And I am a sexual icon. I get it. I can dig it. But before I do, we need to pause for a word from this week's first sponsor, us. I'm not the tall one either. Oh, nice. That's true. Did you do the tutorial though? No, no, because it's a hidden ghost guy. I mean, he's glowing. Everything in the fucking game glows, dude. Guys. Guys. Hey, Eli, uh, did you try to climb stairs again, dude? You got to stop trying to do that. It never works out well. No, 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 no. We need to tell people about God Awful Movies Live in Toronto quick before all the tickets sell out. Really? Are they, they selling that quickly? Yeah. There's only 20 VIP tickets left and only eight platinum tickets. Wow. So if people want those, they better act now. That's right. So tell them, quick, do an ad. I'm going to drink... I'm going to drink some water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're coming to Toronto on May 7th for a god-awful movies live show. Yeah, you don't have to watch the movie or watch the show. We're just going to be making fun of it on stage. It's a really good time. Come out and see us. We have VIP tickets to get you a meet and greet with us after the show. Tell about the platinum tickets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just sip sip the water. Don't, Don't chug it, buddy. Remember? So there are platinum tickets, which include VIP tickets to the show, as well as a private game night and dinner, including all our swag the night before the show. Right. But apparently there's only eight of those left. So, you know, hurry. Seven. We just sold another one. Jesus. There's seven left. Nice. Uneven number. God awful movies. Live in Toronto. Take it to the show notes. Hurry. Get it going. Get them. Please. Your back is sweating a lot. Because I ran so fast. Yeah. <sighs> And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, we have an update on a story we've been following since this show's inception, really. Saudi blogger, liberal Muslim, and Nobel Peace Prize nominee Rafe Badawi has finally been freed from the Saudi prison where he spent the last 10 years of his life. Badawi was originally arrested for hosting an online forum dedicated to progressive Islam views and That's fucking it. Yep. That's the whole thing. He was arrested for presenting the argument that maybe Saudi Arabia could be nicer to women and perhaps some people could belong to other religions somewhere in the world. For that crime, he's been robbed of a decade of his life. And I think we can all agree that on balance, it was a shitty decade, right? Like if you were going to lose it, this was the decade (laughs) to lose. But like it wasn't Saudi prison. But this man missed his kids growing up. But but. To the surprise of pretty much the entire fucking world, the Saudi government released him this week just because his sentence was over, Hmm. uh, which is a hell of a lot more than we've come to expect from their justice system, honestly. Yeah. Saudi Arabia knows how to end a sentence better than Donald fucking Trump. (laughs) Mike Lindell. It's not a high bar, but still, it's something. (laughs) Right. And 
we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that it's not like he just spent 10 years in prison. He spent 10 years in prison with the constant threat of maybe being executed over his head. So the fact that they're just letting him go to carve his name into the beam like Brooks from Shawshank is a weird fucking vibe. Yeah. Okay. Brooks, that was a suicide scene. Let's not have so, yeah, that right. yeah, no, association with what's Rafe doing now. No, he's leaving happily, I'm sure, prison. Yeah. He's the Morgan Freeman carving his There thing. you go. So just a, a quick, well, he's not allowed to leave the fucking country. But yeah, he, he, a quick recap. Rafe Badawi was originally arrested in 2008 on charges of apostasy. He was released that time without charges, but then he remained critical of national religious authorities even after having been warned. So he was arrested again in 2012 on charges of insulting Islam through electronic channels. And by Islam, of course, the religious authorities meant themselves. Eventually, they upgraded that charge to one of apostasy, which carried a potential death threat. But after international backlash, they went back to the lesser charge and sentenced Badawi to 10 years in prison, a quarter million dollar fine. And because their government is defined by its fucking barbarism, a thousand lashes. Yeah. And the U.S. responded with very severe sanctions. Oil. Yes. Nothing. Right. <laughs> right. Look, and, and, and now as near as we can tell, only 50 of those lashes were ever carried out. The plan was to drag him into a public square and lash him 50 times every week for 20 weeks. But a combination of his poor health and the fact that the rest of the world was fully aware that the 1400s ended a while back stayed their whip. So at least as far as we know, the rest of that punishment was forgiven. But despite eight years of concerted effort by world leaders and human rights groups, nothing could convince them to forgive the prison sentence as well. And by concerted efforts, we mean mumbling at their shoes while they hear someone yell Shh, oil and whip a guy starting an online forum. Yes. So human rights yeah. groups are doing a great job, everybody. They're doing a great job. Well, the human rights groups have been very vocal. It's the world leaders that have been like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. so in the interim, his family escaped to Canada where his wife and Seth Hader was tirelessly advocating for his relief. But for years, they had no contact with him whatsoever and were left to wonder if he was healthy, if he was alive, if they ever planned on releasing him. I, I mean, let's not forget that you know, Jamal Khashoggi's example of how they deal with their critics is still hanging out there. So when his sentence ended on February 28th and there was no sign of him, we all assumed the worst. But after a vocal outcry from Amnesty International, we got word on Tuesday that Badawi had been freed. He was in good health and he had spoken to his family by phone. Okay, that's good. I'm going to feel much better when we see Rafe in a picture with today's Toronto Sun, like official, like because he's in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. For God awful movies live in Toronto. Huh? Featuring Rafe. I don't know. Weird fucking vibe. That yeah, would it would be, be pretty <laughs> weird. Yeah. So now, of course, nothing coming out of Saudi Arabia can be all good news. Though Rafe is out of act the actual prison cell, he's still in the larger prison of Saudi Arabia and will be for some time. The government decided to tack on a 10-year travel ban as a condition of his release, so he still can't see his family without endangering them with a return trip to Saudi Arabia. We also don't know that he isn't going to be just rearrested on similarly bullshit charges later on. And we also don't know that he's not going to get like invited into a back room for a fucking appointment with Dr. Bonesaw. Until he's free to rejoin his family in Canada, we need to continue to advocate for his safety. But the dude's safer this week than last. And that is still worth celebrating. Absolutely. And in I'd hope for better news, the Idaho House of Representatives passed a bill Monday afternoon that could and almost certainly will, lead to librarians being prosecuted for checking out materials that are deemed harmful to minors under the same laws meant to punish people who send pornography to children. Jesus. Yeah. And just for context, this is the better of two things they just did in the Idaho house. We're going to get to the other one later. Yeah. This is the better one. This right. is the smarter thing. Right. No, we're easing you into it. And for clarity, by the way, it was for the purposes of the pun. Eli does know better than to hope for more than this out of the Idaho legislation. I, yeah, for sure. I'd have hoped for, yeah, exactly this. <laughs> if I was guessing. So, little background here. You shouldn't give children pornography. That's gross. Let them find it in the woods like our generation. Did. Exactly. And rightly, there's a law about that. Again, there's a good thing. And up until this past Monday, that law included an exception for schools, colleges, universities, museums, or public libraries. Because libraries can't have a little fucking curtained off porn area in the back that you need an ID to get into like video games. <laughs> 
for the younger members of our audience, Video King was... Okay, I'm sorry, there's way too many components there, Luke, but trust me, I, I did a good job with the metaphor just now. I, I did it. I did. Uh, simile. It, it was like a good metaphor. Yeah, how dare you? <laughs> okay, so I get what you're saying, Eli, and I agree, but it is high time for libraries to have a curtained off porn section. Right, like people aren't going to libraries enough anyway. For a lot of lower income people, it's their only reliable access to the internet. This is fair. A lot of jizz moppers are out of work. This is a win-win-win idea. It's a matter of social justice. <laughs> exactly. Now, I agree. Exactly. No illusions, and he then right always thinking of the jizz moppers. Right. <laughs> right. So, as I said, Idaho's House of Representatives passed a bill to remove that exception this week, and could barely contain themselves as they did from saying gay stuff. We want to send librarians to jail for letting kids read books with gay people in them. Yep. <laughs> Bill sponsor representative Guyon de Mordon, who looks like Bill Nye, the science guy's first attempt at drag said, quote, we are simply asking that those that are responsible for the materials in our libraries or in museums or in the other places that are listed in this code are handled sensitively and responsibly. There needs to be more Vigilance, period, end quote. Not adding, I am so clearly a Death Eater, I pretty much just quoted one, end quote. <laughs> See, yeah, quick reminder that when they say pornography, what they mean is whatever we want to censor. Yeah. Right? I, I don't know. Maybe if the most famous quote about your side of an argument is how undefinable it is, you should shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Seems like it. <laughs> And don't worry if Miss de Mordaunt's linguistic labyrinth fooled you. The public hearing on this bill was a lot more clear with a parent group that came out to support the bill objecting to books that featured gay characters, which they claimed violated their children's innocence and confused them with state representative Bruce Skaug adding again, real quote. I would rather my six-year-old grandson start smoking cigarettes tomorrow than get a view of this stuff one time at the public library or anywhere else. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And real word-for-word -word quote. Oh, you like gay porn? Now you're going to read the whole pack of gay <laughs> porn. Wait. Fuck. Where did I get this whole pack of gay porn? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you have some cigarettes. You're illegal. So I think it's obvious what's happening here. Fairy tale villains have escaped their books and are now part of the Idaho House of Representatives. I mean, <laughs> Bruce Skaug, Gayon de Mordaunt. I think that's that true. literally means death in French. I think her <laughs> name is of death in French. No, even if it's not, not it, it is. Not. It is. Nope. But even if it's not, I am going to find a magic pen, get them sucked back into their books. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine, everybody. We figured it out. And in... Hypocritical role news. Ooh, Heath, are you listening? Because I will turn this podcast into a recap show this fast. But please what? don't. This fast. Please don't. Do no, that. That was, this is a pun. I'm not talking about the show. Just relax. Damn it. Just relax. In hypocritical role news, in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, lots of American evangelical Christian leaders are coming out in strong opposition to Vladimir Putin's military campaign. And they're all full of shit. Pretty much all of them are full of shit. A bunch of the most prominent leaders of that community spent the last decade praising a real-life Bond villain on his amazing Christian values. And I don't remember hearing lots of pushback from within the ranks from the other leaders about, you know, the other values he has, like polonium murdering the value, uh -oh. for example. And now they're all about peace and the sanctity of life? Fuck you! Absolutely not. So, um, yeah, if you're new to the show, uh, welcome to the podcast where we... Mention something about religion, and then we yell, fuck you, absolutely not. Oh, just just, just panicky. toss the fucking diatribe formula out there for everybody to use, Heath. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> to be fair, that sums up all of our shows. If you could replace religion with politics, a movie plot, or a thing Morgan wants to do in Dungeons & Dragons. He's got them all. <laughs> <That's> the... <laughs> Don't steal that. So the most important example of the fuck you, absolutely not came from Franklin Graham, one of the most prominent evangelical bigots in the United States. Frey Gray runs a charity <laughs> called Samaritan's Purse that does really nice charity work if you're a Christian and cishet white person. Yep. Otherwise, go fuck yourself. Mm -hmm. Graham responded to the invasion of Ukraine by saying, I don't support war, and I don't know of any Christian that supports war. What? And... Yes, you fucking do. Yes, yes you, you do. do. It's an obvious lie. That's like saying, we don't know any bald atheists with a goatee, Franklin Graham. <laughs> yes, you do, man. <laughs> you, it's your thing. <laughs> it, it, read the Bible. They're all, whatever. Yes. Read yourself. Read a yourself. Fuck. <laughs> but 
Thanks to an article last week by Josiah Reedy in the atheist propaganda newspaper called The Christian Post, <laughs> we got a reminder that Graham's been supporting Putin for years now. Mm -hmm. That includes a statement in 2014, right before the Olympics in Sochi, Russia, when Graham called Putin's homophobic policies a standard of morality higher than our own, meaning higher than the United States, I guess. And he added, quote, Putin is right on these issues. Obviously, he may be wrong about many things, but he has taken a stand to protect his nation's children from the damaging effects of any gay and lesbian agenda. Jesus. Now, to be clear, he's talking about things like Russia having actual criminal penalties for what they call spreading LGBT propaganda. What that actually means is talking about LGBT existence is illegal in Russia. Yeah, no, it's it's downright Floridian. And quick reminder, one of the main justifications the Russian Christian church is using for the invasion in Ukraine is its relative support for LGBTQ rights. Yeah. Also, when he said like, oh, he's wrong about many things, he means war crimes. Right, yes. He means war crimes, which is kind of like saying, but have you seen Hitler's tennis game? The right. four-stroke, yes. the backstroke, yeah. my friends. Graham also visited Russia and met with his boy Putin in person a little bit later. They took a picture together that Graham proudly posted on Twitter like a wacky selfie. Mm -hmm. Just planking with a war criminal. Hashtag YOLO. Ooh, ooh. And <laughs> Graham even did an interview on Russian television during which he said, quote, democracy is not for all people. In some parts of the world, it just doesn't work. OK. He also added broken clock twice a day. I've never been a supporter of sanctions against Russia. So Graham is anti-war and anti-sanctions. Wait, I'm sorry, Heath, are you implying that there's just some inherent problem with a, a appeasing a war criminal all the way up to the Polish border? I don't understand. Well, what and, I mean, his tennis game, We get, I would have to <laughs> yeah. hear about his tennis game. Hey, Noah, say what you will, but at least Neville Chamberlain's platform was peace in our time and not Honing Lord Frockbottom the Third, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, God, they don't rise to the level of Neville Chamberlain. You're they right. Don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we wrap up the story, I just want to add one more thing. Let's quickly address the counter argument you might hear from evangelical apologists about this. They're going to say something like, "Okay, we agree with Putin about hating gay people and hating trans people, but we're against the invasion of Ukraine. Those are two separate things." So. First of all, that's our point. That's the point for us, that sentence you just said. You're an idiot. But more importantly, what's evangelical Christianity doing to help Ukrainian people if you're, you know, against the invasion? You're praying and you're voting for Republicans who a bunch of them are in favor of the invasion. So just fuck you, absolutely not, to, to recap. There you go. And with our A segment, fuck you, absolutely not, quota Matt, we can take a quick break for our word from our next sponsor this week, Stamps.com. Welcome to the Currency Exchange booth at the airport. How can I help you? Yeah, um, I bought rubles on the bounce uh, to prove my coworker wrong. Mm. Do you give refunds? R refunds for money? No, we don't no. give refunds for money. Uh, I was afraid you were going to say that. Well, what if I was willing to give you this? Your empty hand? No, no, it's it's my time. Because, you know, they always say time is money. So maybe I could balance then, okay, it. Yeah, they, they do say that. But no, we don't. We don't accept time. That said, if you do want to save time and money, you should try stamps.com. What's? Stamps.com. Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process. So you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy. Wow, that is a money saver. Plus, you get discounts that you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. It's true. We use Stamps.com to ship our merch for live shows, send out Patreon rewards, and even for our personal mailing stuff. Noah, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm, I'm buying this old Nintendo, but the guy only takes Japanese yen. So. You have a weird hobby. You have a weird hobby. So stop overpaying for shipping with Stamps.com. Sign up with the promo code SCATHING for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code SCATHING. All right. Now, 
about that refund, what if I throw in some bitcoins? Worse. More no, somehow, now that you said that. Beans. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Bodie No Float Face News. Of the many, many atheism t-shirts in my collection. Sorry, ladies, he's taken. The one second most likely to entice strangers to start arguing with me on the street is the one that says religion poisons everything. Many is the time that I've been stopped by a red face and frothing Christian, blissfully unaware of what shirt I'm wearing that day until someone yells the word charity in my face. But I continue to wear it. One, because I like upsetting those people. It makes them live less long. And I'm a chaos <laughs> god. But two, because one time a little old lady stopped me to ask where she could get one. And I wish we were best friends. But blood pressure effect or no, Religion continued to poison absolutely everything this week as a U.S. district judge stopped the federal government from deploying a $1.8 billion warship and its 300 Marines because replacing their anti-vax commanding officer violates his freedom of religion. Okay, see, this is the problem with all this woke bullshit. We get a military <laughs> full of cuck snowflakes and we don't just get the mission accomplished. We, we, we get all tied up in this stuff. Yeah, I just I wish that they would keep their social experiments out of the military, right? Exactly. I mean, it's just it's amazing how you can highlight their hypocrisy just by saying pretty much anything they've ever said anytime <laughs> except when they're saying it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Weird. So the justice in question is the not at all honorable Judge Stephen Douglas Merriday, a George <laughs> Bush senior appointee <laughs> named after a guy who famously argued in favor of more slavery mm -hmm. against Abe Lincoln. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool, 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 cool. This is going to go well. Let's hear about yeah. what Judge Stephen Douglas Meredith had to say. Right, because he could just go by Stephen Meriday and chooses not so to. Like, it's not his fault he was named after him. It's his fault that he keeps that in his fucking <laughs> moniker. Yep. Yeah, so uh, he was sent from God to remind you why it's important for you to show up during the midterms, <laughs> even if Joe Biden did spend his first two years playing with those click-clack balls on his desk while he waited for Joe Manchin to let him do something. Okay, to be clear, that is not what happened. If you're not aware of any positive accomplishments under Joe Biden, despite Joe Manchin being shitty, you're willfully ignorant. And, you know, I'm not doing the homework for you. You figure out what I'm talking about. <laughs> Go look it up. Okay. So you may remember Mary Day. Biden did play with those click clack balls a lot, but that, that's not the point. <laughs> he, he likes to play. It's fun. It's on his desk. He plays you with it. You may got some remember other stuff Mary Day. Okay. You could do two and then two click the other way. <laughs> you can even do three and the middle one keeps clicking it's on so both fun. sides. It's yeah. Very cool. So you may remember Mary Day for blocking a CDC order limiting cruise ship operations during the pandemic back in 2021. So it comes as no surprise that he sided with Comrade Playgrat in this case. Okay, so important clarification on how Biden's been spending his time. It's called the fucking Newton's Cradle, and conservation of energy <laughs> was still new when he was growing up, okay? It was a new idea. Give him a break. It's so cool. Yeah. But it actually gets worse. Technology. Mary Day has ordered the Navy to retain the commanding officer of the warship and deploy him without regard to his vaccination status, yeah. which is fucking insane, right? He might as well command them to fire the missiles from the bench. <laughs> right, when we say we want civilian control of the military, we have specific civilians in mind, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to clarify, it actually goes further than that because Comrade Playgrat isn't just anti-vax. He's a dangerous liar, according to his own superiors, who testified under oath that Comrade Playgrat, quote, refused to get tested for COVID-19 despite showing classic symptoms, then recklessly exposed dozens of his crew to the virus, end quote. Jesus. They also attested that he had intentionally deceived his superiors, defied lawful orders, and demonstrated a pattern of disobedience. Okay. All that stuff also sincerely held Christian beliefs. His job's going to be safe. He's fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm sure fucking... Judge Stonewall Jackson would feel just as strongly if the commanding officer was a Muslim, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then it's what's for sinners news tonight. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> it looks like the Super Bowl cryptocurrency ads aren't going to retain the title of dumbest waste of advertising dollars in human history for long, as we recently learned about a nine figure ad campaign to promote this little known cultural phenomenon called Christianity. Huh. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. What's Led by a fellow Christian <laughs> name of. <laughs> no, not an ad spot. No points. Jesus. <laughs> so he's apparently a psychotic 
woodworker from Bronze Age Israel that got a raw deal in the courts. Anyway, in case you're thinking that a 2,000-year-old dead Jew from before we knew about germs and the number zero doesn't have anything relevant to say to the modern world, the ad campaign would beg to differ. The entire theme of the campaign is that, quote, he gets us, end quote. Cool, yeah. Jesus Christ just trying to sit backwards on a stool at a middle school assembly. Yep. Doesn't make there's not a back on it. He's going to rap with us. Great. Awesome. Right. But he's wearing a robe, so we're all just staring at his dick the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> so, so, yeah, this anonymously funded $100 million campaign is aimed at America's youth who have spent the last couple of decades leaving the church in unprecedented numbers. And while the ads I've seen so far are a bit too vague to come right out and actually say anything substantive, the idea is clearly to counter the narrative that Christianity is all about exclusion and bigotry. That narrative, also known as the truth, is the most <laughs> often cited reason people leave the faith. And I, I think the way that they have to like euphemistically imply that they disagree with outright bigotry rather than just coming out and saying it says it all. Right. Because they, they can't put out an ad that says Jesus doesn't hate LGBTQ people because the Christian backlash would get it taken off the fucking air. Yep. So instead, they put up an ad that says, you know, some of Jesus's best friends were black and hope you catch their meaning. <laughs> Jesus had affirmative action, friends. You're welcome, fellow youths. Right. <laughs> You could literally give one million kids a hundred dollars each and have better success. Yes, kids love cash. Buy them t- t- Tamagotchis or that's, something. That's what the kids are into these days. Sure, but one way or the other, yeah, a hundred million dollars plus a lot of exposure. L- like Eli pointed out, it also could have funded some useful thing for humanity. But they decided to do this instead, or Tamagotchis, one one <laughs> or the other. Yeah. The point is that you'll almost certainly be seeing the hell out of these ads soon. And because the law doesn't yet require them to do it themselves, I just want to tack on a quick pharmaceutical style disclaimer that you can feel free to mentally add at the end when you see them. <clears throat> Side effects of Christianity may include confusion, anxiety, paranoia, sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, general xenophobia, aversion to basic science, <laughs> child abuse, prudery, logical fallacies, boring sex, teleology, and being no fun at parties. While taking Christianity, you may experience heightened gullibility, delusions of grandeur, and decreased bank balances. Be sure to tell your doctor if you experience autonomy, logical coherence, or feelings of self-worth. Do not treat Christianity if you're pregnant or if you're planning to be. <laughs> and finally tonight. Abortions are great and we need to have more of them. Mm -hmm. So I know the standard line for lots of people is I'm pro-choice, not pro-abortion. I'm both. Fuck yeah, man. More of those would be better. (laughs) And as a cisgender man, I think my opinion is very important on this topic. (laughs) Maybe the most important. Yeah. And GOP state lawmakers all over the country tend to agree with me on that. And they're not doing a bit. They genuinely (laughs) agree with me on that. My bit. I've said this before, I'll say it again, a bunch of dudes are making eminent domain laws about the domain called uterus. One of those states is Idaho, where the state Senate just passed a heartbeat bill that would ban the termination of a pregnancy starting at about six weeks. So now it's moving over to the state house. And during a hearing last week, a pro-choice activist named Rowan Astra made a public comment opposing that heartbeat bill. But according to some GOP lawmakers at the hearing, Ms. Astra is a Satanist who does <laughs> blood sacrifice. So, you know, the comment doesn't count. Oh, contraire. I, I have it on good authority that they have to let her command a warship with zombies. Now, those are the fucking rules. <laughs> yeah. Firing fetuses at other ships might not be super damaging, but the psychological effect <laughs> is worth it, my friends. Let me tell you. For sure. So the bill in question is SB 1309. And on top of the nonsense heartbeat thing that would make a grain of rice into a human being under the law, it would also include the bounty hunter concept, like they started in Texas on this. Any family member of a person who has an abortion would be allowed to sue the doctor for $20,000 or more. Jesus. The boba fetus law. (laughs) Well, all that stuff violates the sincerely held religious beliefs of Rowan Astra, who happens to be a non-theistic Satanist. Baby Ebriota. Sorry, I have... Oh! (laughs) Bodily autonomy is a core tenet of that belief system. And according to the Supreme Court, sincerely held religious beliefs are base no backsies. So it... (laughs) Oh, there's no rules. You have all you win. Here's your worship. So they started interrogating Ms. Astra about Satanism. It started with GOP State Representative Heather Scott, a young Earth creationist 
who asked, do you think murder is okay? Uh, Astra explained that no, I don't think murder <laughs> is okay. Do, they, and, and they're basing this on her religion. Like, you're the one that worships the genocidal flood guy. You don't get to ask. We get to ask <laughs> you that. Yeah. yeah. To answer a question with a question, do you plan on trying to arrest the Pixar animators for killing Bing Bong, the imaginary friend? <laughs> do you see what I'm doing here? No. I do not see what you're doing. You do know. not see what I'm doing here. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> the next question was from State Representative. Vito Barbieri. Uh, yeah, he's also from the GOP. You might remember him from way back in 2015. I do. During a similar hearing in Idaho when they were trying to ban abortion pills via telemedicine. A doctor at that hearing was explaining how a patient can swallow a camera and allow the doctor to examine their colon, for example. That's when Barbieri interrupted and said, Can... A pregnant person swallow a camera so you can examine the fetus in utero? The doctor had to stop what they were saying and explain through tears of weeping laughter. No. And also, the vagina doesn't, doesn't really swallow things. I think that's the wrong terminology. <laughs> so, Barbieri, it's, it's his turn to ask a question at this hearing, and we got the following exchange. It's, I want to read. I want to read. It's, it's, okay. It's not, I'll be Barbieri. You're going to be Barbieri? Okay, go. Yeah. I've got some preconceived ideas about your religion. Wouldn't he have an Italian accent? I feel like he oh, would thank have you. A... I've got some preconceived <laughs> ideas about your religion. I'm wondering, is there any tenant with respect to blood sacrifice? Okay, I'll be Rowan Astra for a second. She says, No. And then <laughs> committee chairman Brent Crane jumps in. I'll be him too. He says, Mr. Barbieri, um, let's make sure we keep it to the focus of the bill. Her religion is not on trial. Yeah. And then Barbieri says, what I'm curious about is whether or not there's a tenant with respect to human sacrifice. <laughs> chairman Crane, find a way to tie it back to the bill, buddy. You going to tie it back to the bill there? Barbieri. Long pause. Can't do that. <laughs> but it was real like, We're not making like, this up. Pause, this is real pause, pause, sweating. No. Can't do that. <laughs> and then Chairman Crane says, okay. It was an actually an okay for sure, just like that. Yep. Okay, let's keep it to the bill. No one's religion is on trial. Thanks for your testimony, Rowan Astra. We're done. God. Real quote. All of this is real. Every bit of that was the actual transcript. I'm, I'm staring at that wall again, guys. There's literally no exaggeration level above. Do you sacrifice humans to your dark god in terms of well poisoning <laughs> questions? Yeah. I feel like we need ejector seats built into the chairs in political right? buildings that just automatically go off to certain sentences. No, it's like it's like if ninety six percent of the people have pushed the button or something. Yeah, yeah, I like <laughs> yeah. exactly. I like the ejector, but I like the trap door. That's one. yeah, right. Yeah, with a rank sure. down. Absolutely. Yeah. I want it to go down. Yeah, ranker for sure. Yeah. So, so this is all terrifying. But if they want to get ridiculous, let's get ridiculous. You want to do eminent domain of every uterus? Then every uterus owner needs to get paid fair market value for the organ inside their body. That's how that works. And I did a little bit of math on uh, this concept so Idaho can figure out their budget. So it costs about $100,000 to rent a uterus for nine months. I have questions about how you know that, Heath. <laughs> that it's <laughs> surrogacy. That's the average cost of surrogacy. So, okay, I mean, okay, like, okay, hey, if you've ever rented an apartment in New York City, you've looked into <laughs> it, Okay. <laughs> You've seen smaller apartments <laughs> than a uterus. So spacious. Let's be generous to the state and pretend the eminent domain ruling is a rental. It's not. But, you know, we're trying to cut a deal here. So <laughs> you'll need to rent every uterus for about 40 years. Rough estimate. Idaho has about 500,000 uterus havers of childbearing age right now, with the average person in that group getting about 20 years of rental fees. At a hundred grand per nine months, that works out to about two point seven million dollars on average for each of those five hundred thousand people. Grand total, one trillion three hundred fifty billion dollars for Idaho mm -hmm. for now. Yep. So everybody, go ahead, send them the bill for this. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it looks like we all need to head over to the billing department, so I guess we can close the headlines out there. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, I'll accidentally arm Eli with yet another post-morality financial strategy. Yeah, you will. I wrote that before you started saying it, right? <laughs> it's like I knew. Spring is just around the corner and the warmer weather is perfect for exercising outdoors. And that makes it the perfect time for the new Allbirds. No, tree. don't do it. Don't do it. Heath, what are you what are you doing, man? Don't say the name of the new shoe from Allbirds. It's probably like a, a mystical dragon or something. You're gonna summon it. Don't don't do it. Dude, what are you talking about? We're just talking about the new Tree Dasher 2. I'm war- don't do it. We're tree gonna, Dasher something- two. Tree Dasher do- 2. Oh boy. You did here it comes. Here. Here it comes. It's not. Okay, where's the like fairy king or dragon or whatever? Dude, the the Tree Dasher 2 is the <laughs> next evolution of Allbirds best-selling running shoes. It adds comfort to every run with lighter, more responsive foam, extra grip, and an improved fit to keep you running and nature winning. Made from Allbirds roster of natural materials like merino, wool, eucalyptus, and sugarcane, this everyday running shoe softens impact, smooths transition, and continuously delivers comfort stride after stride. Nothing's getting summoned. Yeah, they gave us a pair to try, and it's become my new walking shoe. They're stylish, but they make running and walking and jogging feel amazing. Okay, and apparently they don't summon a magical creature. That's no, not happening right now. What are you talking about? Spring forward with the Allbirds Tree Dasher 2 running shoe. Discover your perfect pair at allbirds.com today. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S dot com. Right. Okay, so maybe maybe I just imagined the Wall Dasher Mizzle. <laughs> That's it, motherfucker. Got him. Somebody say his name backwards. Somebody say yeah. his name backwards. Yeah, go away. Does he mean Mizzle Dasher Wall? I think he means mirrored. Heath, do you mean mirrored? He's got a fire sword. You want to get burritos? Oh, I so want burritos. Well, help. <laughs> a common rebuttal that atheists get from religious people is the idea that if we got rid of religion, we'd have to replace it with something. Now, as has been pointed out before, that's a lot like saying that we'd have to replace cancer if we ever cured that. But it also overestimates the uniqueness of religion. There are no end of flawed and dangerous worldviews that rely on gullibility and wishful thinking to propagate through time, which is why we need a section called How Bullshit Is It? So tell us, Heath, what load of shit are we going to be talking about today? Today, we're going to be talking about the Quadro Tracker. Or more specifically, the Quadro QRS250G detector. Ooh, letters and numbers. Now it sounds mm-hmm. more real and legitimate. <laughs> sure does. Science. Fuck yeah. So what is the Quadro QRS250G detector? It's dowsing with a marketing department. Uh, <laughs> lovely. Okay, so could you offer the listeners a quick refresher on what dowsing is? Dowsing is... An umbrella term for pseudosciences that employ the idiomotor effect to find stuff. The most common example would be using a Y-shaped stick to look for water. That's the famous example of dowsing. Dowsers also sometimes use bent rods or pendulums or whatever they have on hand. But the idea is the same. They're using the idiomotor effect or just lying Mm -hmm. to point something towards (laughs) something else magically. All right, so uh, could you also offer us like, a quick refresher on what the idiomotor effect is? It's basically a fancy term for unconsciously fidgeting. When you think you're completely still, your muscles are still reacting to things to at least a minuscule degree. And that can be used to, say, influence a pendulum or move a loosely held rod or push a planchette across a Ouija board. A lot of things it can do. Except for the time I was using it in third grade. That was real, and I really did talk to the ghost of Burgess Meredith. Why Why would you want to talk to the ghost of Burgess Meredith? (laughs) Pep talk. You're a bum, Eli. Get up. (laughs) All right. So I I guess the place to start is with this thing's history. So who, you know, for lack of a better term, invented the Quadro Tracker? Okay. So first of all, I promise I'm not reading the character description from a Carl Hyacin novel. The Quadro Tracker was invented by a guy named... Wade L. Quadabaum. No. <laughs> he, he claimed he came up with the idea while trying to invent something to find lost golf balls. Other people would claim 
sometimes in fraud trials against Mr. Quattlebaum, that he came up with the idea after being given a novelty golf ball finder. Either way, he came up with a device that did absolutely nothing and had no real parts. He then went on to sell about a thousand of them for between $400 and $8,000 by claiming they could be used to detect items as varied as drugs, weapons, explosives, specific people, golf balls, of course, alcohol, precious metals, not shitty metals, mm -hmm. just precious ones, dead pets, and wild game. That is a very diverse series of labels on a knob somewhere on this <laughs> instrument. <laughs> no, no. See, there's your problem. You had it set to dead pets, Dave. That's the issue. <laughs> well, okay. So you'd think he'd be nervous about making claims that outlandish. Mm, not if you're paying attention to how these how bullshit segments usually work. You, you, wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't be nervous about it. Not only did he, he claim his device could find all that stuff. He also said it was so powerful, it could detect drugs even after they were ingested. Wow. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> this was a testament to its amazing power and also a foolproof excuse for false positives, of course. According to their promotional material, quote, the tracker will also locate specific drugs in solution. Thus, the tracker will indicate people who are using drugs as well as those who are merely carrying it. Therefore, extreme caution should be taken in searching a person or making accusations as they may indeed not be carrying drugs on them. End quote. Don't worry if the machine is wrong, just do a search of their bloodstream. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, at least that's logically required to be the dumbest claim that they made, right? <laughs> okay, he claimed that it could detect drugs hidden in airtight containers, a bomb in a building from outside, or a criminal suspect from as far as 15 miles away. Wow. He also claimed that the most expensive model, the $8,000 version, could detect a person based on nothing but a Polaroid photo. Come on! That is impossibly stupid. <laughs> no! Okay, whatever level of stupid that is, it's at least one click below impossible stupid. <laughs> Jesus. He's got the detector on his forearm like a falcon. He shows it a picture of you. Go find Eldritch the Far Seeker. Tell him there is more. <laughs> so, I would trust that guy way more. All right. So I, get, I feel like I'm obligated to ask these questions, even when I know what the answers are. So, um, could it detect any of those things? <laughs> it could not. Okay. No. Really? You felt like you had to ask that <laughs> question? No. No, I, I guess it's too much to hope that because the claims were so outlandish and scientifically implausible, people quickly picked up on the hoax and the business was over before it started. It operated for years before anybody Jesus realized Christ. it was bullshit, made a bunch of money. Guys, we are on the wrong side. I can make a beep beep machine by tomorrow. <laughs> you guys, so, okay. we will never have to watch a movie again. Tomorrow we can have a beep beep. No, okay, well, I guess it's also too much to hope that because the claims were so outlandish and scientifically implausible, their customer base was limited to rural, uneducated elderly people that had fallen for some unsolicited sales call his buyers included multiple u.s school districts and police departments oh for fuck's sake so i have wires right here on my desk guys <laughs> so, <laughs> all right so they for for unrelated reasons can you give us an idea what this thing looked like or i, I, I like it did it at least look high tech yeah no it's pretty high tech it looked like a glue gun with a piece of a coat hanger oh out. jesus so, christ fucking dumbest thing i've ever whatever seen. extent you consider that high tech looking you have to google it podcast listener it's insane okay that's what the most visible part looked like the device actually had three components there was the locator card that supposedly contained the signature of the object you wanted to find oh there was also a card reader it's about the size of a small cell phone which was designed be worn on your belt so like ugh, like cell phone holster is somehow built into this the worst mm -hmm. that attached to the glue gun that that uh, the the card reader thing it would attach to the glue gun and it had a, a swiveling metal antenna at the end of it that swiveling antenna was supposed to point to the drugs or the explosives or the dead body that you're looking for okay drugs explosives or a dead body was this 
Were they selling this to the high school at Twin Peaks? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we already know what really happened was the idiot motor effect, but what did Quattlebaum say was happening? Okay, I'm just going to read this straight from the Wikipedia article. Don't you do it, Heath. Don't you do it. Quote, QuadroCorp claimed the device worked by oscillating static electricity produced by the body, inhaling and exhaling gases into and out of the lung cavity to charge the free-floating neutral electrons of the signature card with the major strength of the signal what? End exact quote. What? Original series Star Trek would be embarrassed by that level of technical babble. <laughs> says that you find the dead bodies by the gases they exhale. Oh, oh they're breathing, yeah. So, all right. How did the scam eventually fall apart? <laughs> all right. Well, Someone we have, read that. <laughs> have, no, no, that's not how it fell apart. We needed the fucking FBI. Jesus but Christ. But like one particular smart person there, not the other people who got tricked by it for a while. We have FBI agent Ron Kelly to thank for having the scam actually fall apart eventually. While stationed in Beaumont, Texas in 1995, he learned about the device from a friend on a narcotics task force in Louisiana, and he was immediately suspicious. He got hold of a quadro tracker and using nothing more sophisticated than the local courthouse's x-ray machine. He immediately determined that the device was completely hollow. Oh, my God. <laughs> this, the swiveling antenna was literally the only moving part on the entire thing. <laughs> oh, he no. didn't even bother to put fake stuff inside. <laughs> it. The goonies would be disappointed. Yes. <laughs> oh, but, uh, but, so, but the, the question, though, is do you really need moving parts to oscillate static electricity and charge the free floating neutral electrons? I don't know that you do. <laughs> that's fair. I, I don't know. That's fair. <laughs> this is a good point. But the manufacturer claimed that the mechanism contained conductors, inductors, and oscillators. So, at the very least, Kelly caught the guy in a lie. It's completely empty, so it can't have conductors, inductors, and oscillators. At this point, the FBI commissioned the Sandia National Laboratories to examine the thing, and they confirmed that it contained literally no electronics whatsoever. So other than a couple of random wires and the antenna, it's just an empty plastic box. And this is my favorite part. <laughs> this guy who made it didn't even bother to connect the wires to the antenna. Jesus. The, the locator chip w was made of an, okay, I got to assume this indicates a certain fairly high level of psychopathy on Quattlebaum's part. The, the locator chip was made of dead ants that had been frozen and stuck onto paper with epoxy. Fucking what? Yeah, so the FBI showed up at his door and he was like, so I destroyed my Antocost Museum for nothing. I'm <laughs> under arrest. I'm <laughs> under arrest. <laughs> yep. So did the company even bother to respond to the allegations? They released a statement through their attorneys that said the oscillators in the Quadro Tracker, quote, aren't the type usually thought of by electronics experts, oh, end quote. Okay, that's true, because the type that most electronic experts think of exists. Exists, yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, but we do have laws against selling people dead ants and calling them bomb detectors, right? Right? We do. <laughs> Guys? We do, asterisk. They're not very good laws, but yes, kind of. Oh, no. So Kelly's office brought the whole thing to the courts. They immediately initiated legal action against Quattlebaum's company, and the court issued an injunction that gets as close to barring him from selling the thing as they can get. At the same time, the FBI sent out an alert to law enforcement agencies labeling the device a fraud and urging all the agencies to stop using them immediately, especially if they, quote, use them as a basis for probable cause. Now, seems like you'd just say, stop using them all together. Mm -hmm. But as usual, law enforcement's primary concern was covering their own asses yeah i mean to be fair probable cause has meant how much do you look like a hippie or a black guy since ever so i think a machine that doesn't work is actually an improvement right yeah right <laughs> all right so whatever happened to quattle bomb got off scott fucking free uh, 100 no yep he was indicted for mail fraud in 1996 along with the company's vice president his secretary and a longtime distributor all four men were acquitted on all charges by a federal jury. How? Well, what? 
But this leads to a very obvious question that we have to ask in pretty much every one of these segments. Can I make one? Um, No. <laughs> it doesn't take someone well-schooled in the ways of science to think of an experiment on the level of, you know, let's put the drugs in one of these 11 lockers, then have Ed come in here with the Quadro Tracker and see if it works. This is a pretty simple experiment. Yep. Right. It doesn't take some brilliant act of investigation to notice that once in practice, the device never once actually located drugs. And on top of that, you say many of the users were schools with science teachers and police departments with detectives. So, mm -hmm. yep, that's correct. How the fuck does it take three years for these people to notice that it's a squirt gun with a crochet needle in it? Well, the credulity of the average human being explains a lot of that. But you also have to think about how this works in practice. So imagine you're running a school and your school has a drug problem. I have seen euphoria. I get it. Okay. Yes. Yep. Just like that. So some slick salesman shows up to tell you all about the Quadro Tracker, a device that, according to their literature, has been tested and approved by the FBI, the DEA, and the National Institute of Justice as a drug detector. So... You buy one of these and set somebody to work at the door checking students on the way in. But first, you have a big assembly where you tell the student body about this fantastic new drug detecting technology that they'll have to walk past every morning when they come into school. So even before it's in use, you probably reduce the amount of drugs coming into your school. And once you start actually using it, some of the kids carrying drugs are probably going to look nervous. And since the detector gives intentionally ambiguous results, whoever's checking is way more likely to interpret those results as positive if there's a nervous-looking student right in front of them. Also, at some point, you're going to get a random positive result, and it's going to turn out the kid does have drugs. And when you get a false positive, well, maybe they already used the drugs, like it says in the pamphlet. Right, so, so basically you're saying there's like a drug detection placebo effect. Pretty much, yes. Even after the FBI alerted everybody to the scam, a lot of people kept using it. The principal of a high school in Louisiana who did that summed it up by saying, quote, I heard that there had been some trouble with it, but I tell you what, I'm impressed with it. And this is not necessarily going to be used to catch kids with drugs. If my having this thing keeps kids from bringing drugs on campus, it's worth its weight in gold, end quote. I mean... Since it was literally hollow, yeah. then yeah, probably <laughs> worth its weight in gold. All right. So I guess the only remaining question is, how bullshit is it? Well, technically, all the guys charged with fraud were acquitted, but the FBI still put out a notice calling the thing a fraud. So it's as bullshit as I can legally say it is, I guess. All right. That's where Andrew landed. Uh, interesting. All right. Well, with that reminder that, yes, they are always that dumb, we're going to wrap it up, but there will be more dumb on the next installment of How Bullshit Is It? Before we drop the curtain tonight, I wanted to let you know that if Toronto is too far to see us, well, you can also hook up with us in Atlanta over Easter weekend at the American Atheist Convention. We're teaming up with Andrew Torres to host a charity game night on Thursday evening, and we're going to have a table that you can drop in at all weekend. Check the show notes for links for more information to that, as well as tickets to our live show in Toronto. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half sister show, Citation Dita, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I need to thank Heath Enright for doing all the Heath stuff, Eli Bosnick for doing all the legal Eli stuff, Andrew for keeping Eli focused on just that half of it, Lucinda Illusions for just being Lucinda Illusions, and an unusually huge thanks to Paws for hooking us up with a Farsworth quote from none other than Tim Russ, a.k.a. Lieutenant Commander Tuvok. Fuck yeah, holy hell, that dude can make... Filthy monkey men sound pretty goddamn sexy. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most praiseworthy personages. Nicole, Steve, John, Jacob, Chris, Rosemary, Krista, Lee, John, Guy, Jana, Aaron, and Logan is my favorite X-File. Nicole, Steve, John, and Jacob, whose IQs are higher than Mike Lindell in a Sudafed factory. Chris, Rosemary, Krista, and Lee, who are so fair, mirror, mirror on the wall, started adding asterisks. And Jana, Aaron, and Logan, who are so hot, they've accidentally burned the stove. Together, these 11 elites elongated our elevated elegies this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to buy free shit with it, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll early access to an 
extend an ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingads.com. And if you'd like to help but money's too slippery, you can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. It's the silence of Noah cutting this joke. (laughs) The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.